Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have nine stories, roughly two hours worth as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's go for a really crazy like goal this time. Let's go for 1600 likes. I think if everybody were to take a quick second to drop a like, we could do it. Uh, no pressure. If you feel the video deserves one, it's very much appreciated. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this as often as possible. I hope everybody is staying well. I hope everybody is staying safe. We are definitely in some very wild times, just to put it extremely lightly. With things going on around the world, with things going on in Texas, Florida, Idaho, and now Iowa, um, things are really fucking scary. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I am trans, and a lot of laws have been passed in the U.S. lately to make my life harder, to make other trans people's lives harder. It's extremely fucked up, and I feel like a lot of people don't even know and the sad truth is, it seems like a lot of people don't care. I don't have that large of a platform, and I'm not really sure what I can do in all of this to help. So I, I'm going to do what I can and just say that for any trans people out there, um, stay strong, stay safe. I appreciate you, and we'll get through this. And for anybody out there who wants to partake in the conversation, I recommend you look into the uh, trans laws that have been passed in, again, Texas, Idaho, Iowa, and Florida recently. Texas is making it hell for trans kids right now. Uh, Idaho is just making it hell for anybody who's trans. Iowa recently passed a law that trans women can no longer compete in sport in high school or college, which is extremely fucked up. Um, all of these things are, and Florida is just going for everybody because it's fucking Florida. I am not having a very easy time with all of this, and I'm doing my best to just keep creating content because that's what I do best, but I just want to toss it out there that... Um, if videos start to be a bit slower, it's because I'm taking my time and concentrating on other things. Anyway, I hope you all enjoy the video really quick. For whatever reason, the stories tonight just had a lot of F-bombs. I don't know why, but I try to not alter the stories when I narrate them. So if the word fuck is in the story, I'm just going to say the word fuck. I'm sure you all understand, it's not respectful to the authors for me to change it on the fly like that. Enjoy, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. My sister murdered a girl tonight. I watched her do it, right out here in the woods behind our parents' farmhouse, the home we grew up in. I'm a hundred yards back, crouched beside the barn. We used to play in when we were kids, but my childhood memories are tainted, polluted in the blink of an eye. She's a girl, a victim. Late teens, maybe my age. Her voice, her screams, those sounds will haunt me forever. They were arguing. She was threatening my sister. Shouting that she had evidence, proof that my sister had kidnapped this girl's professor. A professor? But why? It doesn't make any sense. Shit. I think she saw me. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Don't move. Don't breathe. She wouldn't hurt me, right? We're the only family we have left. I'd rather die than turn her to the fucking cops. Deep breaths. That's it. Calm the fuck down. I'm gonna look just to make sure. Oh, fuck. She's digging a grave. She's burying the body. Fuck. I need to think. Think about what I'm gonna do. My sister wasn't always like this. Growing up, 
she was perfect. An overachiever, high school valedictorian, a star in both chorus and theater. Everyone liked her. I looked up to her. Not because of her accomplishments, but because of who she was. How she cared about people. About doing the right thing. Like how she rallied her entire class to volunteer at least one day a week at the nursing home. Or how she stood up to our physical education teacher when he was berating a kid on the spectrum. Her gift was thinking of others. She saw hope where most couldn't. I never lived up to that. Who could? I was rough around the edges. Still am. I was the captain of all my sports teams. Soccer, basketball, softball. I was as competitive as she was compassionate. The yin to her yang. All sisters have a bond, but ours was unique. We were inseparable. Always had each other's backs. If she was the brains... I was her brawn. We used to have hopes, dreams, but all those are dead now. Buried beside the graves of our parents. It still feels like yesterday, when everything changed, but it's been five and a half years. I was visiting her on campus that weekend. The weekend it happened. It was her freshman year at college. She came on a handful of my recruiting trips, but this was different. She was so excited to show her little sis around, so proud like she was giving me a sneak peek into how bright my future could be. Saturday night, she took me to a house party. It felt like everyone knew her. You'd think she was a senior, and boy, or should I say boys, could she flirt. That's just who she was. Charming to a fault. Me? Not so much. I had a boyfriend at the time, so I told all those testosterone-raging leg humpers to fuck off. As the party grew in size, I grew tired of swatting away belligerent douchebags. I bailed without saying goodbye. Little did I know, my sister would never make it home that night. She vanished. Gone without a trace. Initially, everyone. My family... The police, her friends, thought a few of the frat bros had something to do with it. Rightfully so, they were acting guilty as fuck. But it turned out to be someone else. Someone not at the party. Instead, it was a predator lurking from the shadows. A shark stalking its prey. You saw her on every news channel. She trended on Twitter. Her face was all over Instagram and TikTok. True crime podcasts feasted on her like she was a piece of meat. Everyone wanted a taste of the missing college girl. No one knew what happened, but that didn't stop them from spewing their bullshit theories. Fuck the media. Fuck social media. Fuck it all. The man who took her wasn't who they conjured up in their imaginations. He wasn't some lowlife or a freak riding around in a creepy van. He turned out to be rich. Super fucking rich. Educated. Cultured. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth. That piece of shit held her captive for five years. On the day the FBI surrounded his opulent estate, he had six other captives inside his wine cellar turned prison cellar. He killed every single one of them, burned their bodies, including himself. At least that's what the authorities claim. Like a tornado, his infamy overpowered my sister's survival. They coined him the Billionaire Butcher. Netflix is doing a couple specials on him. Better than Bundy, darker than Dahmer. Fuck Netflix. For years I couldn't sleep. My nightmares followed me, haunted me like my own shadow. Everything was taken from us. Our innocence, our future, our past. We all suffered. My parents and I, we searched. Every day for years, it consumed us, devouring our psyches. I'm sure some therapist would psychoanalyze us. 
that the horror still has us by our throats. Well, not my parents. Their agony was suffocating permanently. Two months before my sister made it out alive, my dad left the gas on. The note said that their souls couldn't take the torture anymore. They professed their love for me, for my sister, too. I didn't know if I was angry with them for leaving, or for not taking me with them. That night, before I left to see one of my clients, my parents said something I'll never forget. Family sticks together, no matter what. For the past six months, my sister has insisted their death isn't what it seems. She's maintained that she didn't escape. She was set free. She's stressed that her abductor, the wealthiest serial killer in history, is still alive. That he's hiding somewhere, protected by his family's immeasurable power. She's warned that he's going to kill more women. It sounds like the ramblings of a... a person with PTSD. She's still fucking digging. Maybe there's room for two. Or three. Murder-suicide wouldn't be so bad, would it? Fuck this, I'm not thinking straight. I need to rest. I'm going inside the barn. Looks like my parents left it. Some boxes moved around. When we played hide and seek, I was the only kid brave enough to descend into the root cellar. No one knew my dad transformed it into a half-decent man cave. While everyone was getting bitten by ticks, I was snacking on fruit by the foot. He is on the hook. I just need a minute. Looking for the light. Got it. What the fuck? There's someone down here, bare-chested in the corner of the room. He's just staring at me. I don't know what to do. He looks homeless. Like he hasn't showered in days. His hair and beard are mangy. I can't tell if he's gaunt or just has 0% body fat. There's a cut on his forehead. His ankle is swollen and bandaged. I'm gonna ask if he's okay. Fuck. He just lunged at me. But he was jerked back. He's chained to a thick pipe. He's screaming at me, shouting that we don't have much time. He's begging me to let him go. Oh my god. It's him. The girl's professor. He's swearing he's a former FBI profiler. That my sister kidnapped him three months ago. He's claiming that my sister wasn't immune. That she has Stockholm Syndrome. That she killed one, maybe two women while in captivity. I think I'm gonna pass out. He's still talking. But... I breathe deep breaths. Fuck. He's insisting she's hunting him down. The man everyone thinks is dead. That these past six months, there were casualties. He could prove it. First, some crime blogger. She buried him in the woods. Next, a private investigator hired by the family. She ran him off the road. He's pointing to the corner of the room. Fuck me. There are maps, timelines, photos, victims. That's it. I have to get help. Wait. I hear something. Shit. She's here. I'll let you know when I turn her in. I'm lying on the floor of my childhood bedroom. It's been a while since I've been in here. My mind is racing. All I keep thinking is, I wish he would have taken me instead. My sister, she came barreling down the root cellar stairs, gun drawn at me, at the professor. I don't fucking know. I blacked out, but once I came to, I confronted her with everything. You know what she said? I could use your help. Those fucking words. My help? Yeah, she could use a lot of fucking help. I screamed at the top of my lungs, yelled at her until my vocal cords snapped. 
How could she? After all this, she was becoming him. She confessed she was suffering, drowning in her trauma, conflicted by who she was, who she's become. Then, like a bolt of lightning, it struck me. The last thing my parents told me on the night of their murder. Family sticks together, no matter what. My sister is a serial killer. Now, I'm her accomplice. She leans a flower. I watch her through her window while I'm cloaked by pine trees. If only I could touch her. Just to be next to her would take the pain away. She sits on her chair, brushing her hair, staring at the night sky. I wish I was one of those stars she looked at. Then I'd be closer to her. I wonder what she smells like. I wonder what she's thinking. I wish I could hear her heartbeat. The first time I saw her was when she was getting on the Ferris wheel. She looks so happy standing next to Tommy Dax. Good old Tommy football hero. I suppose he was what she liked. He got to drive around in his daddy's Plymouth convertible. Hell of a nice ride. That probably made a difference, along with his fucking football jacket. I began following them around a bit that night in July, just to make sure she was okay. She looked happy enough. I knew she'd be happier with me, though. I'd treat her better. One time I actually spoke to her at the corner store. She dropped a bottle of cough medicine. I picked it up and she thanked me. I asked her if she was sick and she smiled and told me she was getting it for Ma before turning and walking to the counter. That's when I was greeted with a slap to the back of the head from Tommy. He grabbed me by the back of my hair and pulled me between the next aisle of the store. You get the fuck on out of here, you freak. He spat at me. That was the one and only time I spoke to Shailene. In September, the formal dance for Glen High School came up on the calendar. I can't remember the last time I went to a dance. Or danced. I'm not really one for crowds. No one would want to go to one with me anyway. As Tommy's son, I'm a freak. But I knew Shailene would be going. Going with a football jacket jack off. You must have liked her, but something seemed off about him. I decided to go along. When I say go along, I mean I spent my time sitting in my car, in the car park. An hour before the dance ended, the doors to the hall burst open, and out came a wave of suits and dresses that jumped into cars. Engines roared and tires rolled out to the road. I lay down in my seat when I saw Tommy and Shailene walking out hand in hand. I heard the door to the Plymouth open and close. I heard the engine roar. I heard the tires move forward. That's when I sat up and followed. They headed east, up Anne's Way End. Surely they were driving up to Finn's Point. Half of everyone from the dance probably was too. I turned off my lights and sat about 50 meters away. But the Plymouth pulled left into Stitchwan Crescent. That was a forest road, nothing but the old mill down there. I wondered why the fuck they would be going down there. Turning off my lights, just going on instinct, I kept following. A minute later, the Plymouth pulled over, and so did I. The lucky bastard was about to make it with Shailene Dwight, but why did he drive her here? It's so cold and fucking desolate. When the sounds of a beer bottle bursting on the gravel echoed, I figured out why. Up ahead I made out the figures of Jerry Winslow and Gavin Trunks. They were two team members from Tommy's football team. They laughed as they drew in cigarette smoke and breathed it out into the night. Tommy's door opened to more laughter, but in her cut with a scream. It was Shailene. Something was wrong. That's when I saw an arm move at breakneck speed toward her. Tommy had thrown a haymaker right hand at her cheek. Her head hit the left side window like a crash test dummy. I had to do something. They were going to have 
their way with her. That was what these pieces of shit were planning. I could run up and try to take on all three. Maybe find a branch to hit one of them with, but my heart was racing. They'd fucking kill me. I had no chance. They walked forward toward the car. Who's first? Chuckled Tommy. Then an unexpected sound called out into the night. It was a kind of roar, but not like I'd heard before. It almost sounded human. Jerry and Gavin immediately jumped into their cars. The same as Tommy. In less than ten seconds, they were gunning it back up the road at a scary pace. They drove straight past my car, but that was the least of their worries I could tell. I was so fucking scared. I felt like a failure, too. But then I heard the sound again. The roar. I had to get back in the car and get out of there. I had to help Shailene, but I wasn't fast enough. The next thing I remember is waking up in my car. I felt like I was getting a cold. The sun was beaming through the windscreen. I felt like I was getting sunburned. What was the time? Had I slept all night? Checking my watch, I saw that it was 8 a.m. Shit. It was going to be a hell of a hot day if the sun was this temperature so early. That was my first thought. My second thought slapped me upside the head. Shailene. I had to find her. I high-tailed it out of there, feeling woozy as all fuck. Then I realized the cross piece on my necklace must have been sitting in the sun for an hour attracting heat. I took it over my head as I drove like a bat out of hell towards Shailene's house. It left a burn mark on my collarbone. I arrived. I jumped out of the car and ran to her front door. I don't know what the heck I was going to say, but I thumped on the front door. In a matter of seconds, a tall man answered the door. A disgusting stench came breezing out the door. It smelled like burnt garlic. Hello, son. What can I do for you? He asked me. Sir, I'm a friend of Shailene. Is she okay? He replied, Oh, yes, son. I take it you were at the dance last night when she fell on the guitar speaker. She's always been a klutz. A bit like her dad, I guess. Chip off the old block. She's a sleeping son. But you're a good friend to come around. He closed the door. Thank God she was okay, but she had lied, told her parents a story. Why had she covered for Tommy like that? That's when I knew she was in love, but she was in love with a bad person. I could have marched right back up to that door and told her dad what happened, or asked to speak with Shailene. Hey, remember me from the corner store? Yeah, I picked up the medicine for you. By the way, you don't know me, but your boyfriend is wrong for you, and you're making a huge mistake. Yeah, I had no chance, so I drove home. That was the longest drive of my life. Never mind the heat. Never mind the fucking burn mark from my cross necklace. Which stung like hell, by the way. The long part was the hole in my heart. Shailene had fallen for the captain of the football team. The most popular guy in the school. Everything that I wasn't. Me being a freak. Him being a hero. He was also a monster. And she still wanted him. What did that make me? Less than fucking zero. I slept all day until 8pm. I woke up feeling strange and hungry. I felt so damn hungry. At least the heat had wavered. I went straight to the fridge. I'd only stocked up a couple of days ago, but nothing in there caught my eye. Maybe a burger? Yeah. I'd go out and grab a burger. Medium rare. Or rare. That's what I felt like, but... Then Shailene jumped into my brain and overtook my hunger. I drove over to her house again. Maybe I could ask her dad if I could see her. Maybe she would talk to me. I hoped she was feeling better. I hoped she was okay. I turned into her streets when I saw the Plymouth convertible, parked right outside Shailene's house. Fuck. This guy's that much better than me? 
I sat in my car defeated again. I wondered how people could be so predictable. Now Shailene had let her would-be rapist into her home, and so had her dad. Is this how life is meant to be? One punch to the face after the other before the final straight right goodbye? Maybe I'm not meant to be here. Maybe life is just a random pile of shit. I slumped down in my seat. I could have crawled inside the earth right there, if not for the sound of booming voices coming from Shailene's doorstep. I perked up. Shailene stood her right eye as black as ink, her daddy next to her, and Tommy, Tommy rolling on the grass beneath him, cowering. You get the fuck out of here and don't you ever come back. Shailene's dad exclaimed with deathly intention. Tommy shuffled backward from the Dwight family's old house. He looked scared. Maybe it was the first time he had ever been. Then he got on his feet and ran. Ran down the road. Left his daddy's car. All I could do was just watch as Mr. Dwight took Shailene inside and closed the door again. I'd sat around again like the loser I was while it all happened in front of me. Mr. Apprehension. Mr. Always thinks about it and does nothing. And so I sat there. Sat there for an hour in the dark wondering how I could not be such a fucking failure. That's when I saw movement. Beyond the Dwight family's back fence line, I saw a faint silhouette. Something crept there. It was too far away for me to be seeing in the dark, especially with my shit eyesight. At the same time as Shailene's bedroom light came on, I saw the Glen High football jacket light up. It was Tommy. He was back, but he wasn't alone. More silhouettes. He had brought his boys. Back for revenge. I had to do something. No more sitting and watching. I pulled on the door handle and its weight glided to the curb. I slipped out into the night, but something in me had changed. Maybe it had changed before I decided to do something. Maybe it had changed while I was still in the car. But whatever it was, I wasn't scared anymore. My anxiety had been replaced. Now, I was filled with something else. Something that bubbled away while I scoured within shadows toward the pack of predators. I thought it was anger. But then I fell toward the ground. The woozy feeling I had on Stitch 1 Crescent came back tenfold. I felt like emptying my guts, but I had to keep going. I rose to my feet and stumbled forward in pain. This cunt and her cunt dad are going to get in. I heard Tommy whisper, but how could I hear him? I was at least 50 feet away. His two gang army sneered back at him. I'll stand on your shoulders, Gav. Jerry, you go knock on the front door and hide. Then you two pull that pussy outside. That'll give me all the time I need upstairs. No, I couldn't let this happen. Despite the pain I felt... Not this time. So I walked into the fire. Then the fire looked back at me. Tommy, Gavin, and Jerry each turned to face me almost simultaneously. They represented my future of pain. Pain that a skinny, glasses-wearing coward had no answer for. You, Tommy said, smiling. But as he said my name, my fingers throbbed crimson. The tips of my fingers cracked and bled with agony. It felt like a dozen splinters were skyrocketing out of the tips of my fingers at once. What the fuck? Then the tide rolled in. I fell under an invisible weight. The night enveloped me. The agony from my fingertips encompassed the whole being as I flapped around on the earth. The pain came from the inside out. Needles cursed into my organs. This little cunt is having a seizure, laughed Tommy, and so did Gavin and Jerry, but their laughs and smiles left their faces when I stood up. I wonder what they thought of how I looked. My eyes were pitch black when I looked into the mirror later that night. Each of their grins dropped. They all looked confused and scared at the same time. In a matter of seconds, I was on top of both Gavin and Jerry. 
slicing my fingernails over and into their faces until they made no sound. But Tommy did. He cried out into the night like a bitch. His footsteps thundered as fast as I think he could hope for. When I looked up from the bloody mess my newly grown claws had made out of his friend's mangled faces, I saw him running. He gained a lot of ground in a short space of time, but it just wouldn't do. Not now. I caught him in less than a few seconds, stabbing my new fingernails into his neck. He fell straight to the ground and rolled over facing me. He was crying. Please, please man, what the fuck are you? I'm sorry. Just let me go. One precise strike to his jugular was all it took. His voice box turned to gargling blood. But there would be no biting. No chance for another life. Not for any of them. Then I heard the sound of Shailene's voice. Is someone there? She sat through her open window into the night. I wanted to tell her what I did. What I did to help her. And what could have happened. But no. I wish I was. I wish I could be that man. But I'm not. I'm just not made that way anymore. Now I was more alone than I'd ever been. That's when I heard the faint sound of leaves crunching to my right. I turned to face where it came from. My eyes met those of a stranger, but when it breathed, the sound of it breathing, I knew its faint growl. I knew its voice. It stepped toward me into the moonlight. Beautiful. She was beautiful. She looked at what I had become and smiled. I left with her. The hunger comes back every few days, but she's taught me that it's okay to be hungry. What really matters is who I decide to eat. Who we decide to eat. I'm a relatively new parent. I know that I don't know everything, but I do know this behavior is not normal. My daughter just turned one and was happy and healthy most of the time. She woke up in the night crying like all babies do, but the crying changed. Before, when she was a newborn, she would cry for milk or comfort. But starting a few weeks ago, she began screaming in terror. Every night, at the same time, 3 a.m., she would sit upright in her crib, huddled in a corner, staring at the same spot in her room, screaming. Nothing my wife or I did could get her back down, except take her out of that nursery to sleep with us. Once we noticed the scratch marks on her arms and face, we quit trying to put her down in her room, opting to bring her hours at bedtime. At first, I thought she was doing it all out of childlike fear of the dark, but now, I don't think so. She continued this nightly ritual for weeks, no matter where we put her down to sleep, sitting up at 3 a.m., staring and screaming at something we couldn't see. Always the darkest corner of the room, always empty when shined with light, but in the dark, shadows play tricks on your eyes. I would imagine shifting, writhing, Maybe it was her contagious fear that had me seeing things. I hope so. I never heard her cry like that any other time, but I did notice a change in her after a while. She wouldn't smile anymore. She stopped eating her favorite foods. She seemed so anxious all the time, peering around corners before entering rooms, or just staying curled up in one spot all day. We took her to a doctor. We explained her behavior and checked her health. She wasn't sick, as far as the pediatrician could tell, but she was diagnosed with anxiety. I didn't know babies could be clinically anxious, but being a parent teaches you a lot, I suppose. There's no medicine to treat the mental health of a one-year-old, so the one doctor just told me to be extra patient and to be sure to give her lots of love and attention. But she didn't seem interested in that. We held her, kept her near us. But it was like she didn't even notice. She stopped willingly going to bed. 
fighting her sleep for hours until it took her, just to awaken again at 3 a.m. The first morning I woke up without a nightmare episode, I was so relieved. I thought the night terrors had passed and that my daughter would return to normal soon, until I rolled over to look at her. She was sitting, staring directly at me, smiling. Not the cute, innocent smile of a baby, but a deranged, unnerving smile. One that a cracked person would wear. A look that should never be on the face of a one-year-old. I could immediately tell she had been awake for hours. Bloodshot eyes framed in deep bags. Cracked lips dried out from hours of smiling. I picked her up, but her demeanor didn't change at all. Not for the rest of the day. No eating, no nap, no dirty diapers. Just a horrible smile. We should have taken her back in right then. But I am ashamed to admit that we didn't. We wanted to give it one more day. I don't know what the doctor would have done. But maybe it could have prevented what came next. She fell asleep early that night. Something my wife and I took as a good sign. We kept her in the bed with us, comforted by her steady breathing, until 3 a.m. I woke up with an odd sensation. A slight turn of my head told me why. My daughter was inches away from my face, smiling that same unhinged smile. I shouted in surprise and backed off. So did she, but in the most unnatural way. She scuttled backward faster than I had ever seen her move, right off the side of our California king, but there was no thud signaling her fall to the floor. When I looked over the edge of the bed, she was nowhere in sight, so I peeked under it. There she was, grinning at me. That look should never be on the face of a child. I knew it wasn't her anymore. I'm not a religious man. But I decided right there that I should be calling an exorcist in the morning. The way she had moved away from me, had presumably climbed down the side of the bed, it was not natural. My wife woke up then. When I heard her rouse, I rose from my place on the ground, and my little girl shot out from under our bed like a spider, quicker than any baby could move. My wife and I screamed. We followed her into the nursery where it took us a moment to locate her. She was sitting in the darkest corner, atop a tall bookshelf in her closet. We only found her because of the muttering. She had said her first words months ago. She was a smart kid, ahead of the curve, but this wasn't babbling, or the one to two word sentences to toddlers. This was chanting, raspier and deeper than her voice should have been able to go. She was tearing at her arms and face with her nails, staring and grinning at us. I was afraid, but also angry. Angry at whatever had a hold of my daughter. I tried to grab her, but it was like she wasn't a baby anymore. She was so quick and agile. She dove between my outstretched arms and landed on my chest. She clawed and bit at my throat as if trying to tear it out. I stumbled back and pushed her off me. She hit the ground hard and I stopped. She began crying. Her normal, sad little cry she reserved when she got hurt. Hope filled my heart as I approached her, but of course it wasn't her. Again she lunged at me, this time attacking my face, but my wife was ready. She caught my once innocent child and attempted to restrain her little arms. My daughter contorted her body and my wife lost her hold. I know kids are flexible, but the way she didn't. It's been playing tricks in my mind over and over. Bending unnaturally. Cracking loudly as if her little bones couldn't handle the strain. And the way she loped off after. Almost injured. We haven't seen her since. I think she got into the vents. The main one isn't hard to reach. We keep hearing thumping and strange outbursts, like a manic child hiccuping with excitement, and the cracking. Each time I hear a loud crack, my heart breaks. I think whatever it is knows that. 
It's hurting her to terrorize me. I don't know what took my daughter, but all I want is her sweet little self back. More than anything, I don't know where to turn. Maybe the Catholic Church? The police? Please help me. The sun is rising and I think she is getting antsy in our vents. I need help. Please. I just want my daughter back. I don't want my mattress anymore. It's got my ex-boyfriend's sweat in it. His skin flakes, a mixture of wood smoke cologne ringed with stale body odor seeps from it. When I wake up, I think he's still lying next to me. I don't want to be reminded of him, of the things they did on this mattress while I was at work. I don't want to think about all the nights I've slept with him on it, blissfully ignorant. I undress the stupid thing, ripping the blankets and the sheets off to uncover a yellow-stained, thin mattress, patterned with fading blue flowers. When I was a teenager, I had taken it with me when I moved out of my home five years ago. I flip it up and away from me. It's hard, like a giant biscuit. I shimmy it across the room and prop it against the wall, blocking half the tallow-colored sunlight beaming through my only window. When I sit on the metal frame and release a long sigh, I drive for nearly an hour beneath the darkening sky to the light industrial quarter of the city, where dusty streets are lined with tall signs lettered with jumbo font advertising furniture stores, and I park in front of a mattress warehouse. Wandering the expansive store, I sit on a random mattress and bounce a few times to test its comfort while sneaking a hand down to the giant laminated price tag. My eyes widen at the price. I let the tag swing down and get up, my neck craning as I scan the sprawling warehouse for any signage, curious if they got a budget section. I find a nest of mattresses thin and cheap looking, and step towards the one with a big sale sign. Can I help you there? My head jerks forward. The man's voice is so close I nearly scream. I turn to see a short, thick set man with black hair slicked down over his skull. He's around my age and a little familiar. His hands are up. Sorry, it didn't mean to scare you. He clears his throat. These carpeted floors make me quiet as a mouse in church, I swear. He taps the floor with one foot. His grin tightens half his face, wrinkling the skin so tight his right eye closes. It jogs a memory. I know this guy. That's okay. I turn and look at the mattress again. How much is that one? I point to the cheap-looking queen mattress with the giant sail tag. You like that one? He grunts as he squats to check the price tag. His button shirt accordions under pressure, and through the gaps, I see a yellowed singlet. Let's see. 499. He looks at me, dark eyes bulging. It's Marty. Marty from elementary school. This guy had a crush on me, sent me a Valentine's Day card asking me out. I'd rejected him. The next day at recess, he snuck up behind me and pulled my pants down in front of everyone. No one had yelled or laughed, just stared. I'd pulled my pants back up over my yellow underwear and ran. In no direction, I ran and cried until my legs gave up and I collapsed in the middle of a golf course. Oh, that's a good price, I say turning away from the bed. Hey, you're Shirley. He points with one eye closed. Right? Tanglewood Elementary? I sigh and nod. Marty, right? He stands, glancing at me for a moment before staring at the carpet. He rubs the back of his neck and his ears turn red. Damn. He shakes his head as though struggling to find words. Look, I'm sorry about what happened back then. How I acted. 
No, no, don't worry about it. I should go. I search for the exit but can't see it. I always meant to say, I'm really sorry, Shirley. I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. I fiddle with my purse straps. We were just kids. Plenty worse has happened. That's not an excuse. He sits on the cheap mattress, rubbing his head. I knew better. That was horrible what I did, and I never apologized to you. His dark, wet eyes turn up at me. I'm so, so sorry, Shirley. I stop fiddling. A ball of warmth breaks in my chest and I nod and sit down on the mattress across from him. Thank you, Marty. I appreciate that. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? I shake my head. The apology is enough. Slapping both hands on the mattress, Marty's eyes charge with energy. Hey, you know what? What? I'm going to give you a great deal on a mattress. I chuckle. You don't have to do that. Not just any mattress. The best we have. He gets to his feet. Come on, I'll show you. I get up and follow. You don't have to do that, seriously. He paces across the store in long strides, then turns back to me and keeps talking as he walks backwards. It's new technology. Just came in. We customized it and everything. He turns forward and leads me to showroom where the mattresses are thicker and fluffier, and the signs are bordered with gold that shimmers under the soft lighting. No way I can afford these. He waves my words away. Try this one. He points to a mattress of lavishly sculpted white fabric. I shake my head looking at him. He issues that cheesy grin, scrunching half his face. Trust me, my fiancé loves it. Snores like a baby, and I'll customize it just for you. I'm surprised and relieved to hear he's got a fiancé. I return the grin and lay on it. As though being cradled, the mattress seems to shape itself to my body as it absorbs my weight, gently supporting it. Wow. Told ya. It's like sleeping on a cloud. I smile. Okay, let's do it. I spend a week sleeping on the couch before the mattress is delivered. To my surprise, Marty's at the door when I answer. He's got on a white collared shirt and a red tie. With his sleeves rolled up and he's standing next to a tall man in blue overalls. I didn't realize salesmen deliver too. He smiles. No, not usually, but I just... I wanted to make sure it's perfect. Make sure there's no problems. Nodding, I show them through to my bedroom. They make short work of removing my old hard biscuit mattress and carry in the new one with specific metal handles attached along the mattress's side. With great care almost dignity. They move it on to the base, shuffle it gently into an exact position. They stand back to admire their work. It gleams fresh and white like a giant eraser, and I feel lighter on my feet, relieved to have jettisoned all physical traces of my ex-boyfriend. Wanna lay down? Make sure it feels right? I shake my head. Oh no, it's too nice to lay down on. I smirk. The men share a laugh. I have to go to work soon anyway. Marty nods and looks at the other men. Can you grab the paperwork? The man returns to the truck. Marty glances around the room at the crumbling metropolis of makeup atop my dresser. The open closet with clothes spilling out. The sci-fi books on my bedside tables. So, I was wondering if you want to catch up for a drink sometime. Reminisce on the old days. He grins, hands in his pockets. I'm standing just inside the bedroom doorway and he's across the room from me. I cross my arms. We didn't really know each other. He shrugs, peering into my closet. Maybe we can change that. I don't know. I don't think that's a great idea. He turns to me brow furrowed. Really? He snorts. I don't mean that way. I've got a fiancé, Shirley. Jeez. 
I just thought you might want to treat me to a cup of coffee or something. To, you know, thank me for all this. It wasn't cheap. He opens my blanket box and casually peers in. Have you got a mattress protector? My gut tightens, forcing out all my breath. Before I can speak, I swallow hard. Can you not look through my things, please? He shuts the box and smiles. Hiding secrets, surely? I didn't ask for the mattress. You offered. Come on. He spreads out his arms. Don't be like that. My back's against the door jam, one foot in the hallway. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. I say, rubbing my arms. From down the hall, I hear the man in overalls returning with the paperwork. His approaching footsteps cause my muscles to relax. Don't be silly, Marty says, swiping a black stick of hair from his forehead. I was just joking around. As I sign the paperwork, Marty steps past me and I catch a whiff of his hair, the sickly sweet tang of hair gel. In my pajamas, I'm lying on the bed staring into darkness. It's a warm, humid night, and already my skin is sticking to my cotton shirt and pants. The standing fan struggles in the corner, whirring in agony against the thick air. The mattress sucks at my body as if trying to absorb me into itself. It must be the memory foam. I'm just not used to it. Shallow breathing triggers my eyes to snap open, but all I see is black. Was that my breathing? I try to rise from bed, but I can't. I'm stuck to the mattress, fused to it. Coldness fills my chest as I struggle against it, but... It's as if my body's submerging into thick dough, and I can't break free. A glimmer of light at the end of the bed catches my gaze, and I force my head to bend forward and see what it is. Shimmering in the darkness, Marty's eyes staring at me. He's standing at the foot of the bed, grinning. His eyes two silver crescents. The eyes move down to look at my groin. His hands grip the side of my pants. In one hard tug, he rips them off, exposing yellow underwear. I try to scream, but nothing comes. My heart hammers in my chest. The room stinks of hair gel, and a horrible sound cuts it like a knife being pulled through a block. Marty's grin flares to an inhuman size, and he crawls on top of me. His naked arms and legs sink into the mattress, and our limbs entwine. Skin and bone rubbing together. It steals my breath and sends my flesh crawling. I use every ounce of force inside my body to scream, enough to produce a faint squeak that, like a valve, opens into a shrill cry. My eyes open to a pale, sunlit room. Looking down, my body is fully clothed and damp, chest to legs, with cold sweat. I sit upright, catching my breath and hug my legs. The mattress is back to normal. It's just a mattress. It was a nightmare. I rub my head with a trembling hand, wondering if I've ever had a night terror so vivid. The camera is a cheap little white cube. I prop it on the bookshelf, aim it at my bed, and turn it on to record myself sleeping. The night terrors have persisted for a week, and I need to prove to myself I'm not going mad. That Marty isn't entering my room at night. I know how crazy it sounds, but every night, it's like he's in the room with me and I can hear him breathing. The night terrors play out as usual. Shallow breathing that sounds like it's coming from outside me. Sinking into the mattress, and then Marty, staring at me from the end of the bed his eyes and that horrid grin shimmering in reflected moonlight. Three times I wake up, startled, skin popping cold sweat. It can't be the new mattress causing these night terrors. The thought is ridiculous. The bed's so comfortable I feel like the queen laying in it. But still, something's wrong. Like there's a wooden sliver in the lining of my stomach that tightens my gut every time I go to bed. Arriving home, 
late from work. I grab the camera off the bookshelf. I sit on my bun and plug it into my phone. There's a mistake. There's almost 20 hours of footage. I'd left the camera recording all day. Scrolling back through the footage, a dark mass flashes across the screen. My heart skips a beat. The phone drops from my hand. It's probably nothing. Something fell and passed in front of the camera. I pick up the phone and scroll back over it, but slower this time. Something big moves across the screen. The timestamp reads 4.25 p.m., about two hours ago before I arrived home from work. My mouth is dry. I press play. On my phone, video plays of my empty bun. From left of screen, a figure enters. A man's legs and pudgy stomach. Because of the low camera angle, I can't see his face. From the bedroom door, he walks around to the side of the, my bun nearest the camera and crouches down. Head lowering into frame. It's Marty. What the fuck? I say aloud. Heaviness expands inside my gut, weighing me down like an anvil. On screen, Marty lifts the fitted sheets and grips the two metal loops along the center of the bed and turns them like keys. He heaves the top layer up by metal loops and the bed opens like a hinged clamshell, revealing a hollowed out chamber in the bottom half. My hands are trembling and I nearly dropped the phone, so I laid on my leg and gripped the bed covers. I feel dizzy. The bottom chamber is like a sarcophagus. Foam padding with a cavity carved into the shape of a human body lines the bottom. He steps into it and lays in the cavity while grabbing a clear plastic mask, connected to a hose that curls inward from a hole at the base of the mattress. Marty pulls straps over his head, fixing the mask over his mouth and nose, then slowly lays down flat while bracing the top layer with his hand and letting it lever down on top of him. The bed closes with him inside, facing upward. I look at my mattress and time seems to stop. This can't be real. Slowly, I rise from it and step away. I go into the hallway. My mind's tangled mess of thoughts, my pulse is racing, and a strong compulsion to run away from my apartment floods my body. But I clench my fists and remain standing. Turning, I face my bedroom doorway and breathe deep through my nose. The cops need to find him inside my bed. I want them to find him like that. I walk backwards to my hall closet, not even glancing in. I grab a coil of nylon rope I use for camping. Entering the bedroom, I grip the end of the rope and roll the spool across the floor under the bun. Halfway, it snags on a shoebox. The space under my bed frame is snug, and I know I can't crawl far enough under to grab it. I slide a bedside table over the rope end to secure it. Stepping lightly, I lift a coat hanger from my closet rack and move to the other side of the bun. Laying on the floor, I slip my arm under the bed and with the questing end of the hook, attempt to fish out the rope spool. The bed creaks, sending a jolt of ice through my spine. Shuffling inside the mattress, laying on the floor, still not breathing. A dark circle catches my gaze. It's on the bottom of the mattress. A black hole. I hover the back of my hand under it. A gentle blow tingles hairs on the back of my hand. Marty's breath. My eyes squeeze shut and I pull my hand away. A vinegar smell punches into my nose. His breath. Burning bile rises in my throat and I think I might puke, but after three attempts I manage a hard swallow. Blindly. Quiet as possible. I wave the coat hanger. It bumps something hard. The spool. I knock it towards me further and further until the spool rolls out. Like rotating a delicate cryptex, I pay the rope out across bed with outstretched arms. 
and meet the waxed end held under the bedside table. The nylon rope is strong. It's like climbing rope. But I don't trust one length enough, so I repeat the process three more times, rolling the spool, hooking it on the other side, and then looping it over the top. As I'm paying out the fourth band of rope over the bend, the spool slips from my hands, rolls off the bed and onto my bedside table. It knocks into a glass of water, and the glass upends off the table and breaks on the floor. Breath hitches in my throat, and every muscle in my body tightens, shuffling noise inside the bed. To a loud grunt, the bed starts to open. I jump onto it, my weight snapping the mattress shut. Knees spread at the center. I lean over and reach for the rope spool. I'm sent a few inches in the air as he tries to push me off, but I shift my weight in time. The rope spool is just out of reach. His attempt loosened the loops, planting all fours on the center of the mattress. I raise my chin and spot my phone on the floor. It must have dropped from my pocket when I jumped on the bed. No way to reach in. My body is raised into the air as he pushes up the mattress lid, but within seconds it slams shut again. He's grunting and I can hear the air blowing and sucking through his breathing tube. The rope loops around the bed are looser. Another push and they'll be useless. Now's my only chance. Eyeing the spool, I lunge off the bed, grab it, then grab the rope end, pull them tight and tie them together. Drawing the tie of rope taut against the mattress, I work through two knots. The lid cracks open and pushes against the rope loops. Marty coughs and chuckles as he lowers the lid. My heart's beating so hard it hurts my chest. I quadruple tie the knots, grab my phone, and hop back onto the bun. You're not getting away with this, you fucker. I rasp between heavy breaths. Kneeling, I dial 911 and I speak to the operator. I explain that there's a man in my house and to send the police. The operator takes my address and asks me to stay in the line until police arrive. One of the bands of rope saws back and forth across the bed in rapid bursts. I grab it in one hand, and it comes away loose. Leaning on all four as I peer over the edge of the mattress, a small knife blade juts out the sign. The blade finishes cutting the second loop and begins sawing the third. While the third loop frays apart, I tell the phone operator that Marty's going to get out and that he's going to try and kill me. Can you run? Can you leave the apartment? Yes. Then run now. Get out and yell for help. But what if he... The mattress rushes into my face as though hit by a wave. The room tilts violently and I'm sliding off the mattress and collapsing onto the floor. Pressing the floor hard with both palms, I pull my legs under me and lunge out of the bedroom. At the hallway closet, halfway to the apartment door, I stop. An image enters my mind of me as a girl, running away, crying after Marty ripped my pants down. I'm not that kid anymore. I open the hallway closet and grab my squash racket. I turn back to face the bedroom, holding up the racket with both hands. Marty emerges, hunched over in a stained, disheveled singlet and pair of tracksuit pants. I don't want to hurt you. He says, stopping just outside the bedroom doorway. His body is turned sidelong. One hand is held up in surrender while the other hangs nearly out of view, gripping the knife. His black hair is scuffed and falling in his face. With the knife hand, he swipes the hair across his forehead. Uncurtaining, bulging dark eyes that lock onto mine with intense ferocity, as if at the point of ignition. Within them struggles a competing mix of fear and violence. Get out of my way. I widen my stance, gripping the racket tighter. The police are coming. I say flatly. He steps closer. I hold the racket higher, ready to swing. Gritting his teeth, a large vein pops from his skull and his chest rises and falls like an accelerating piston. 
Staring him down, my heartbeat slows and my breathing evens out. Go on, I say firmly. Try and get past me. He grins. I'll cut you. He says in a shaky voice. I take a step towards him. I'll break your face. He giggles nervously, nose wrinkled, spittle flying from his mouth. Then his eyes drain of energy and shaking his head as though in disbelief his posture slackens. The knife drops from his hand and clatters to the floor. Eyes half closed, he dips his head. He's no longer looking at me. I lower the racket. Marty crouches to the floor and sits, back against the wall. With shaking, almost panicked breaths, he hugs his legs and rocks back and forth. A sharp, singular wail releases from him, and he starts crying the way a toddler cries after being injured, howling and sniffling, eyes red with tears. I put the racket back in the closet and lean against the wall and watch Marty. He grows quiet, sirens blare in the near distance. The horizontally slatted light of sunset laces Marty's body in a red glow as he rocks against the wall, sucking his thumb with his eyes closed muttering in tongues like a madman in prayer. As I watched in a horrified near paralysis, the frail 62-year-old Patricia Hansen, the very same Patricia Hansen who would invite you over for tea and homemade cookies, at any given opportunity, gouge her own eyeballs out of their sockets with her dull, nailless fingertips, said nails having been chewed down to the quick, daily, over the previous six months. Right in the middle of our daily, group meditation session while screaming at the top of her lungs, I've looked upon the face of our god. Our god is a dung beetle. The devourer comes. I began to realize we were in this thing too deep, and I doubted we would ever make it back to normalcy. Normalcy. What even is that anymore? I wondered as the white-coated residential assistants swarmed into our small meeting space and attempted futilely to restrain Miss Hansen. And do we even want it? Our living conditions at the sterile, beige, and sepia-toned care home were far from normal. I almost wished, if only for a second, that my body were still riddled with the cancer that, just one year ago, was destined to take my life. Not only my life, but those of my co-residents. Just a year ago, we were two dozen middle-aged and terminally ill cancer patients, allegedly beyond the healing power of modern Western medicine. Cervical, ovarian, prostate, liver, pancreatic. We had the worst of them. When an opportunity arose for a different, potentially life-saving treatment, I initially hesitated, as did some of the others. A cross-world trip to the Himalayas where I could very likely die and would potentially not get to see the prime childhood years of my daughter, Katie. Well... It didn't seem like an attractive option, but I ultimately realized it was at least something because staying in my current situation meant a sure and certain death. To take the trip to Nepal was hope and the promise of more of Katie's tiny hugs and butterfly kisses. We lost one of our lot on the way out there, 45-year-old Joshua Taylor. A pancreatic cancer patient was nearly denied the trip due to his ill health, but he made a last minute, nearly miraculous turnaround and was cleared to go. In the final days, his medical recliner was several away from mine on the flight out. That guy really liked fishing. He'd expressed some hope that we'd get a chance to fish some raging mountain river at some point in our experimental treatment. Poor guy went out choking on a torrent of blood which suddenly began spouting profusely from his mouth at 35,000 feet. The Nepalese monks welcomed us with open arms, after our hired transport managed to get us over the rugged terrain to their mountainside retreat. 
They didn't speak much English, but somehow we didn't need language to communicate with them. They knew what we needed before we did. Mostly what we needed, it seemed, was peace and quiet. Simple, decent food, and hours and hours of intense meditation. Through their teaching, we learned how to go deep within ourselves. At first, simply to isolate and manage our aches and pains. Then later, to, after a couple months of training and several more losses amongst our cohorts, seek out and destroy the cancer cells that were consuming our bodies. Once we'd learned this final, miraculous step, our recoveries began to take off. Beyond physical healing, we felt complete with both mentally and spiritually. We then began to learn further secrets and tricks of meditation that allowed us to not only go deep within ourselves, but to group meditate, wherein we would handle the burdens and challenges of each other. In the end, the 18 of us who left the monastery were in the best health of our lives. Still, our doctors did not let us return to our homes and scheduled routine, but prescribed extended, secluded, follow-on treatment at the Maple Hill Care Home. Only the story could have ended with our full healing, but it didn't. As it turns out, that kind of deep group meditation is not just fulfilling, it is also highly addictive. Daily, when our group would meet for therapy and peer support in the home's small conference room, we would launch into hours-long group meditation sessions, in which our minds would meld together and solve the problems of the world. Individually, we were capable, but as a group, we could push ourselves leagues deeper than we could ever reach alone. For most of us, these were overwhelmingly positive experiences, but for the silent others, some went to locations in the spiritual realm that they never desired to see. It was a few weeks after we'd started these sessions that ovarian cancer survivor Kathy Threat ended her life with a bedsheet noose. We didn't connect the dots at the time. Kathy had been missing her family and the home's no-visitor policy had been especially hard on her. She'd frequently shared this sentiment with us. However, I'd seen a darkness in her thoughts during our group sessions that I think may have been more of the reason for her fatal decision. And she wasn't the only one. Brandon Leitner heard the voices of his deceased mother speaking to him as he tried to sleep at night. It was even so bad that he could feel the warmth of her breath in his ear. Jamal Stevens would occasionally debate audibly with himself the exact thickness of the veil that separates our living world from the realm of the dead. Apparently he could both see and touch this veil. Still we pushed on into the deepest depths of our souls, like meditation junkies. Unfortunately, Miss Hansen's exercise of removing her physical eyeballs was not helpful. No. The vision she wished to be cleansed from was not something sensed by physical eyes, but more the domain of the inner eye that we had all developed and cultivated over the past year. As they transported her away to the ER, writhing and kicking upon the gurney, my sympathies went with her. But as the doors closed behind them, I felt relieved that the residential assistance hadn't ended our session short, and I sensed that same relief from the others. Instead of ending our session, we simply intertwined our fingers, bowed our heads, and plunged once more into the often terrifying depths of our souls. Attending my younger brother's funeral was something I never thought I'd have to do. At the age of 18, he was still growing into himself, getting ready to take on the world. He was getting ready to leave our small town and go off to New York for college after graduation, but things started changing for him in those last few months, it seemed. He'd once been top of his class, sociable, confident, expressive. In the months leading up to his death, he'd become withdrawn. He started failing his classes, became snappy and paranoid. 
He constantly curled in on himself, and he glared at everyone around him. My mom seemed to shrug it off as teenage hormones, but I thought there was something seriously wrong with him. He trusted me with a lot of things, and one of those things was his recent paranoia. He told me that one day while he was taking a shower, he'd sneezed. But despite him being home alone, someone had told him, Bless you, in a hushed tone. He'd seemed so paranoid about it, but I'd brushed it off at the time as stress over his upcoming finals and told him not to worry too much. He would tried to argue, tried saying he kept hearing it, even weeks later, but I'd told him to drop it. Now he was dead in a casket in front of me, pale as a cloud in the sky. They'd ruled his death as a heart attack despite him having no previous heart conditions. And even our mother wouldn't believe that, not with how we'd found him. Blood leaked from his nose and dried all over his face, eyes wide open and empty staring a hen. His mouth was sitting gaped open, and his back was resting arched off the bed, arms bent oddly beside him. I still remember the scream my mother let out when she had gone upstairs to check on him. My wife had comfortingly wrapped her arms around me as we'd walked back to the car following the service, but I had hardly acknowledged it. Too distracted by my thoughts and my younger brother's sudden death to concentrate on anything but this sudden misery. I'm sure I could have done something differently. Maybe if I'd talked to him more, tried getting him out of the house, tried helping him keep up with all those studies and exams... Maybe I could have changed things and kept him from disappearing like that. Those were the thoughts going through my head for the few weeks surrounding the service. I'd soon come to find out that listening to his concerns would have been the best thing that I could have done. A bit more backstory on my town, I suppose, would shed some more light on this subject. We came from a small, peaceful little town outside of a major city with a population of a little over 2,000. Or at least, it had been a little over 2,000. You see, my brother was one of many increasing cases of heart attacks or heart failures plaguing our town over the last year. We weren't sure how it started, but people were having them left and right. And with it, our population had dwindled down to about 1,000. I know it seems extreme and hard to believe. 1,000 deaths in one year. And almost all attributed to strange heart attacks. I found it hard to believe too, but then again, I'd also found my brother's concerns hard to believe in the beginning. I'm not writing this story to try and sway you or convince you. Because I know some people will choose not to listen. I am writing this as a warning to all of you. Don't follow in our footsteps. Don't make the same mistakes that we did. On the third week following his funeral, it had happened. I was exhausted after a long day at work, stressed and aching, and I had wandered upstairs to take a nice hot shower. Eyes closed, hands washing out my hair. I'd felt a tickle in my nose, and lo and behold, I sneezed. Then I heard it. Bless you. It was so soft and quiet, I almost missed it. And in a momentary haze, I'd assume my wife had heard me and answered me. Exiting and drying off, I'd pass her on my way to the closet with a quick thanks. For what? She glanced at me in confusion, and I returned her look. You know, for saying bless you. When I'd sneezed earlier... I threw on my pajamas as she chuckled and shook her hand. The stress must be getting to you, hon. I didn't even know you sneezed, so I didn't tell you that. She shook her head again as she passed me, pressing a kiss to my cheek and telling me to get some good sleep tonight. But if she hadn't... No, that would be ridiculous. There was no way. There was no way my brother had been telling the truth, right? I sighed as I settled down for the night, chalking it all up to stress over my brother's death and my mind playing tricks on me. It had to be a figment of my imagination. That was it. I'd be fine. 
Spoiler alert, it was not a figment of my imagination, and I would not be fine. Even as I find myself typing this out, I don't know how much time I have left. I was an idiot. I probably still am, but I'm trying my hardest to get my story out there so all of you can prepare yourselves. The members of our town that haven't sneezed in the shower are beginning to think that the rest of us have gone crazy. That we're hallucinating. That some sort of illness is spreading like crazy. If only they knew. If only they experienced what we were experiencing. That little voice doesn't stay a quiet little whisper, driving you slowly to insanity. Oh, how I wished that were the case. How much more preferable that would be. No. It grows louder. It starts off as a whisper, a little hush when you're in the shower, and then every time following that it grows stronger. When I was making my breakfast the next day, it was still fairly quiet, brushing against my ears. When I was driving to work a few days later, it sounded like someone speaking from outside my car. When I was at work, it sounded like someone was saying it from down the hall. Louder, 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 it continuously grows. I can't take it anymore. It's gotten to the point that it feels like whoever is saying it is right behind me, yelling it into my ears. It makes me curl in on myself, makes me shudder, makes tears bloom in my eyes. I can feel it. It feels like fingers dragging themselves along my brain, digging in and pulling. I don't know how loud it will grow to be. There are other symptoms as well. Insomnia, loss of appetite, occasional to frequent nosebleeds, dizziness, nausea. The list goes on and on and continues growing the closer I get to my approaching doom. And fuck the paranoia. The paranoia claws at you from the inside. Even as I'm sitting at home alone, I can feel eyes on me. Here, bated breaths. It tears you up from the inside. It drives you mad. It seems that my brother's change in appearance had made so much more sense. I wonder if blood loss is how we die. Our blood emptying from our noses until there's nothing left inside. They started as little drops of blood every now and then. A little nose bleeds. Nowadays it flows, streams out of my nose, and stains all of my clothing. It's the sneezing that's the worst, though. No longer gentle sneezes. As the voice grows louder, the sneezes grow more intense. Blood shoots out accompanying any snot, dizziness, and nausea rack you. And if you aren't lucky, you'll end up vomiting or at least dry heaving post sneeze. It's painful and it stings and feels like dying. I currently feel like I'm dying. I don't know what to do anymore. All of us are alone. All of us that have sneezed in the shower. Our loved ones abandon us, calling us crazy or trying to isolate themselves as they don't catch whatever illness we have. My wife, who I'd previously told about my brother's claims, believed me to be insane, saying it was stress and that his own delusions had become my own. It was crazy to me how the woman I once loved and held so close could now come to look at me with such fear and disgust. Although, how could I blame her? I'd lost weight. I'd become erratic. I didn't sleep anymore, and even the smell of food made me start to gag. She hadn't even tried to file for divorce. She had simply walked out the door a few weeks ago and told me to never speak to her again. We have nowhere to go. Nobody to turn to. Even doctors won't try and help us, as they say there's no feasible cause for any of the symptoms. At least not that they want to try to look into. I'm sure they think us all as crazy as our loved ones did. So again, I'm writing this for you as a warning. Do not, under any circumstances, sneeze in the shower. I don't know how far the problem is spreading. I've already seen articles of increasing heart attacks a few cities over. If only they'd known, but now at least you do. I beg of you, 
spread the knowledge around, tell your friends, tell your family members. All they have to do is hold it in. Get out of the shower if you must. Shut it off. Run a few rooms away. Finish the shower later. I promise you it's not worth it. You might think of me as crazy and stupid as they all did, but we know. Those of us that have done it know. I can feel it. I can feel it growing closer, clawing at me, scratching at me. I think I only have a couple days left. To anyone that doubted me, I wish you believed me this one last time. I can already feel my nose starting to itch again, the blood starting to build up. I've stopped trying to hold them in. There's no point in prolonging the inevitable. I fear there's no cure from this. Not once it's set into motion. If this is the last thing I do with my life, I hope it works. Goodbye, Aaron. God, if only I'd listen to you. And goodbye, Lucy. I hope you can still find a way to be happy somewhere, even if you think of me as a monster to be avoided. Goodbye to all of you as well that have heeded my words, that have made it this far. Please, I beg of you. I can't stand the thought of anyone else suffering the way I have. Resist the urge to do it at all costs, and maybe you won't become one of us. Signing off from the world, and soon, from my life. Farewell. I remember the first time I truly questioned my sanity. As time would go on, I'd think back to things that were definitely red flags, as some would say. But the first time I truly believed that something might be wrong was Christmas Day 2019. I don't actually remember a ton from this day. Postpartum depression was raging through me, and the first couple of years of my youngest child's life are pretty much a blur. I remember it was getting dark. My partner and I were sitting on the living room floor with our children, playing with their new toys. That's when I just happened to notice a red, flashing light, reflecting off one of their new toys. It truly doesn't seem like anything, a room full of beeping, flashing toys, but I remember being entranced by this red, flashing light. I tried to glance around and find the source, as I was only seeing the reflection. And I could not locate where this was coming from. And just as soon as I started racking my brain around trying to figure out what was happening, it stopped flashing. It was silly. It was nothing. Not worth mentioning. Though, it could be noted as the beginning. A few weeks go by. Time doesn't really matter. I know it was fairly soon after the first incident, but as I said before, dates times. Life is just a blur. My partner and I were heading home, kids in tow, after a long, pleasant evening with my parents at their home. Not sure what time it was, but it was dark outside. My partner driving, we head down a long hill with a spotlight at the end, a road we've driven a million times before. I look ahead and notice the stoplight. It's red, but it's not a solid red light. It seems to be fading in and out, red to black. I am all of a sudden hyper-focused on the light. Was this normal? Do red lights always fade in and out like this? And I just never noticed. But again, before I could even articulate what I was seeing, the light turned to green, a normal, solid green light. I asked my partner if he noticed that the red light wasn't solid, and he seemed confused. Said he hadn't noticed anything. These were the moments. The small instances that made me question my whole reality. It seems so silly. These are such small things. Unverifiable things. Things no one else could vouch for. Things no one around me noticed, but things in an already fragile mental state. I was in a tailspin. The front door to our home, our beautiful dream home, was bright red. The only red door in the neighborhood. 
This cookie cutter neighborhood where every house was almost identical, but my door was red. What did this mean? Why did I cringe every time I saw the door? The unique red door that stood out to me so much while looking at a home. The red door that I loved so much now made me question my reality every time I saw it. Red became a trigger. Again, these are silly things. Silly things that otherwise would mean nothing. But having a red door made me never want to leave the house. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to have to open that door. I suppose this is when I started my... isolation. This also happened to be the start of the COVID pandemic. So staying home wasn't weird. Staying away from people wasn't weird. We ended up moving to a new city early in 2020. I was truly excited. A fresh start closer to my family. I'd be able to see them more. Get more help with the kids as my partner worked long hours and wasn't home much. This move didn't make a ton of sense from the standpoint of moving further away from his work, but getting to be closer to family was very important. I was struggling. I was in therapy. I needed all hands on deck. Though, as most things, the last few years, the pandemic fucked that up. My family wouldn't see me or my children because of the pandemic. I went for over six months with no face-to-face -face interactions with anyone outside of my partner and children. So now I'm stuck at home with three small children. With even less help from my partner. So he worked so much and now was significantly further away. And no familial help. Our new home was less than perfect as well. It had a red door as well. Silly little things, like the children's bedroom was always much colder than the rest of the home. They were scared of it. They called it the spirit room. They'd sleep with me. I was being touched, grabbed, climbed on all day, and slept on all night. I'd hear the scurrying of little feet running down the long hallway while my boys would sleep. I'd hear doors closing. I'd hear knocking on the front door. I'd find things had been moved from their rightful spots. My partner, oblivious to what was going on around us, he always had logical explanations for everything, but he wasn't there. He wasn't experiencing these things. I was living them, though no one around me was noticing. Why was I the only one noticing? I remember getting caught up in some Reddit thread about living in a simulation. I delved too hard into that realm. I had to do a keyword block ultimately so I wouldn't see this type of thing anymore. I was cognitively aware enough to know that my psyche couldn't handle it. I knew that it wouldn't take very much for me to truly believe that I was, in fact, living in a simulation. But blocking the posts from coming up wasn't a fix-all type of cure. I'd catch myself spiraling. My oldest child had very frequent nosebleeds. The kind that would keep coming and coming, sometimes in his sleep. He'd wake me up, covered in blood. Red, in my half-awake stupor, I'd clean him up, get him turned back in, and spiral. This isn't real. None of this is real. The kids aren't real. My partner isn't real. I'm in a coma somewhere, hooked up to machines. I'd stay up all night afraid I'd wake up in a hospital bed being told that I'd created this life out of nothing. I'd wake up without my boys. So instead I'd lie awake with a sweaty baby clinging to me. I'd breathe in the scent of his hair. I'd squeeze his little foot. I'd calm myself. I'd say, this is real. It has to be. Can you hold something that isn't real? Can you smell something that isn't real? I ultimately decided to confide in my partner. In a more light-hearted, I'm only kind of serious, but actually it's really serious type of way. I explained the simulation thing and I expressed that I truly felt that it would take minimal convincing for me to actually succumb to the belief that I was, in fact, living in a simulation. I'm afraid, though, that I have been a little too light-hearted. He began to joke about it. He began to speak in a monotone voice at me. This isn't real. I'm not real. Wake up. 
and I'd laugh it off, but he'd keep going. He'd leave for work and tell me, I'll be back later, or maybe not since I'm not real. I'd tell him to stop. I'd tell him it scared me when he acted this way. It made me question my entire life. Every move I made, I was on the edge of reality. Teetering back and forth, I knew it was a difficult balancing act, but I didn't want to tell anyone else. I didn't want to be vulnerable again. I didn't want anyone else intentionally making me question my reality. So I'd lie awake at night, sniffing my baby's heads, squeezing his little feet anytime I needed to be brought back to reality. I ended up having to drive out of town, a few cities over, to pick up my sister from the airport. It was the longest I had been away from the kids in years. Probably the longest I'd been alone and even longer. I don't remember much of this drive. It is a pretty barren road in the desert, not much for sightseeing. But off in the distance I saw a spotlight. It was red. It was fading in and out. I lose memory from this point. I awoke in the hospital. I'd crashed apparently. Single car accident. I suppose it was a little apparent that I wasn't in a great frame of mind, or maybe they suspected I had a brain injury. They asked me so many questions. Is there anyone we can call? I said to call my partner, but I couldn't remember the number. How could I not remember his phone number? It's been his number for 10 years. How could I not remember? I asked if they had my phone. His number would be there, but it wasn't. Maybe something happened to my phone in the accident. It's fine. It'll come back to me. Can you verify the make and model of your vehicle for the police report? Ah, uh, yes, I remember that one. A Toyota Sienna for sure. Lots of room for the car seats, but I clarified the kids weren't with me, just in case they'd worry. I was met with confused looks. The vehicle we pulled you out of was a Ford Focus. Did you borrow someone else's car? I was confused. I didn't quite know how to answer that one. I definitely did not borrow someone else's car. I definitely was driving my van. Neither I nor my partner owned a Focus. He drove a Dodge Ram, which I had actually never driven before. The only car I would have been in would be my own. I had a moment of what I thought was clarity, and I remembered that my car insurance information was saved on my phone. I always made sure to have an updated copy of my insurance card saved. Just in case I didn't have cell service if I were to get pulled over. I pulled up my card and to my disbelief the card read 2014 Ford Focus SE. I broke down. I was sobbing. I was irate. I was so angry. Nothing made sense. None of what they were telling me made sense. I believe they ended up sedating me. I woke up to my father sitting on the edge of my hospital bed. I'd never seen him look so unnerved. He looked so much older than the last time I had seen him. He looked so tired. Eyes sunken in, frail, gray in the beard, little white chest hairs popping up through the top of his button-up shirt. But when he saw my eyes open, he lit up. We've been looking everywhere for you. How long have I been here? What's he talking about? We've been trying to find you for years. I can finally bring you home. I asked where my partner was. Where are my boys? Why aren't they here yet? Aren't they worried about me? Are you taking me home to them? He looked so confused, mixed with deep sadness. He said, Sweetie, I'm not sure who you're talking about, but I can get you home with me and Mom, and we can figure out everything from there. We've all been looking for you for so long. Everyone is going to be so happy to see you. What was he talking about? We came over for Sunday dinner almost every weekend before the pandemic hit. He knows his grandsons. He knows my partner of literally almost ten years. I was angry. I screamed at him. Did he talk to you? Did he put you up to this? It's one thing to have my own partner poking fun at my grip on reality, but this is too fucking much. Where are my kids? 
The nurses come in and dose me with something. I fall to sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'm mostly in the hospital now. My dad comes to see me often. He brings me pictures of my nephews. He tells me stories of what's happened since we last saw each other. But I don't believe a word that comes out of that man's mouth. I have figured out how to hide my pills away to make sure the nurses think I'm taking them. I'm usually able to pull it off for a while and stay up all night trying to figure out what is happening. But eventually I'll crash. Then I'll wake up at my little house with the bright red door. With my minivan parked out front. That's where I am now. Laying in my bed with my sweaty baby lying on me. Smelling his hair. Squeezing his little foot. I will always find my way back here. In May of 2019, I was getting ready to go on vacation. We were going a couple states away and my parents had rented a house from somewhere for a couple months over the summer. As I was picking out clothes to put in my suitcase, I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. I set the shirt I was holding down and opened the Discord notification on my screen. Someone with an illegible username and a pink and white profile picture had sent me a friend request. I know what you're probably thinking. Hey dumbass, that's a stranger on the internet. You probably shouldn't talk to them. And I agree, but I was on a couple different gaming servers and I didn't think too much into it. A lot of people sent me friend requests so we could play together. Anyways, so I accepted the friend request and immediately got that little sticker of Wampus from the girl who introduced herself as Lindsay. We talked for the next hour or so until my mom yelled at me to finish packing. I told Lindsay I had to stop texting for a bit and she asked why. I told her I was going on vacation and put my phone down for a couple of hours to finish what I needed to do. After dinner, I picked up my phone again and saw 32 messages from her. I was a little weirded out, but thought she might have just been the type that sends a million messages for one thought. Or maybe she had sent me some TikToks. Fast forward about a week, and I had just finished putting my stuff in the dresser I had in the house my parents rented. Lindsay and I had talked all day, every day since we met, and now wasn't any different. I threw myself down on my bed and pulled out my phone. Me. Hey, I'm back. Sorry I had to put my stuff away. Lindsay. That's alright, silly. I know you'll always come back to me. And hey, maybe we can meet up sometime soon. I live in that area. I frowned at my phone trying to remember if I hadn't ever told her where I was going. I quickly read back through all of our messages and didn't find anything. Eventually, I had convinced myself I had told her on call and forgot about it. Me. Yeah, that would be awesome. Maybe you could come here. We have a pool. Lindsay. Maybe I will. A couple weeks passed by and everything seemed normal. I was actually starting to have a crush on Lindsay. We talked often, called every night, and we told each other everything. One day, my dad took me out to a lake and we spent all day there, just messing around. I was having fun and didn't check my phone until I was back at the house and at that point, it was dark. When I turned my phone on, I had over 100 messages from Lindsay. At first, the messages seemed playful, but they started getting more and more hostile as time went on. The last message she sent said, Fine, if you won't come back to me... I guess I'll have to come find you. I'll admit, I was freaked out. No girl had ever obsessed over me like that. I texted her asking what she meant and she immediately played it off as some creepy joke to scare me when I came back. I believed her until it happened again and again over the next couple weeks. The breaking point was when I didn't talk to her for a full 24 hour period. She sent me really hostile messages for a while and even tried spam calling me after a couple hours. The message that scared me the most, though, was her last. She sent me a picture of the house from the road. I couldn't even play that off. I knew for a fact I had never told her the exact address of where I was staying. Suddenly, she called me. 
She must have seen that I was online. Lindsay, what the fuck is wrong with you? Where are you? All I heard was an unhinged giggle through my phone and water splashing like someone was kicking their feet in the pool. I looked out my window at the pool, but it was dark and raining outside, so I couldn't see anything. Suddenly, I heard her get off the call and lightning struck. To my horror, I saw her sitting at the pool grinning straight up at me. I ran through the house to get my parents and told them there was a random woman at the house and begged them to call the cops. My mom called the cops while my dad went outside to check. He came back in and said he didn't find anyone but cops were already on their way. I was terrified. Luckily, we were leaving to go home soon, so I was silently praying I could just leave all this behind. It's been almost three years now. I blocked Lindsay and tried to forget about her, but I still see her sitting at the edge of the pool in my dreams every now and then. The cops never found her. My parents have agreed that we'll never go back, but sometimes I still feel like she's going to find me one day. Fog. A dense accumulation of tiny water droplets suspended in the atmosphere close to the Earth's surface with obscures or restricts vision. That was exactly what Joshua and I were looking at. My god. Joshua uttered quietly as he walked away from his car, forgetting to lock in. Matt, what are we looking at? He said to me without taking his eyes off what was in front of him. It looks like fog, I think. I answered hesitantly. Not even I was sure about the situation. It looked different from what you would usually see. Luckily, we weren't alone. Gwen and Sam finally took the courage to step out of the automobile. Sam staggered, taking in the view that was in front of him. Have they built a wall around our hometown or something? Matthew, is this why you called us yesterday? That's not a wall, Sam, although I am not sure what it is. Gwen spoke up, following her lover. And she was right. It wasn't a wall. Yet, from afar, it would look like one. The fog seemed to have entirely blocked the view of the village, though that wasn't all. Looking left and right, it seemed to go on and on, almost as if only the town was chosen to be engulfed by the white curtain. None of us had been able to contact our family or friends that still live there. It has been like that for days. Eventually, I grew worried, thinking something might have happened to my sister. Joshua, Gwen, and Sam seemed to have the same distress, so we decided to meet up and check out what was going on for ourselves. Looking at the amount of police cars who were parked at the side of the road, you could understand how worried all of us were. It's definitely not a wall, but I think we should go inside and see for ourselves. I responded. Gwen stormed at me and clutched the collar of my shirt. Look at the amount of cars that are standing just outside the town, Matt. Sam and I have counted at least five police cars, all empty. Either they are already getting help as we speak, or something happened to those officers. Even though she was right, something felt off about the situation. Maybe it really was a crazy idea to go inside, but as stubborn as I am, that did not hold me back. Yanking my shirt free, I wanted an answer. But just before I could, Josh cut me off. That is great and all, but I think you should come and check this out. Joshua had been toying around with one of the cars. If the police was inside, and the cars outside, maybe there was a way of communicating with the officers. I thought to myself. What did you find? Sam asked as we walked up to him. Static. All of the radios of the cars are giving nothing but static noise. There was worry in his voice. Sam took the two-way radio out of Josh's hands to hear for himself. Let's go. He then said in a firm voice, dropping the radio out of his hands. Josh was barely swift enough to prevent it from hitting the ground. He gave a worried look at Gwen and me and signed that we should follow Sam. I nodded. 
In that fog, anyone could get lost, especially Sam. Without thinking, one after the other grabbed each other's hands. All of us were equally squared. Josh displayed it the most. He walked through the white curtain with his eyes closed and holding his breath. It's okay. The air feels heavy, but it seems safe. He let out his breath at once and started coughing from inhaling the vapor. After a few minutes of walking through the fog, the light of Sam's phone died down. None of our phones seemed to work anymore. It was as though all power and communication was cut off by the mist that we stood in. A barrier of some sorts. Without a light, we were not going to make it far. The further we got, the thicker it seemed to become. It became hard to see what was in front of you. At that moment, I was glad we hadn't decided to drive into the fog. Accidents were bound to happen at this point. We're going back, otherwise we all get lost, Sam said, taking the lead. Then it dawned on us. None of us recognized where we were. It was almost as if we were no longer on Earth just walking inside of a dark cloud that not even sunlight could pierce. In which way would that be, Sam? Gwen asked him. Not wanting to admit that he was lost, he dragged us along with him, further into the fog. He never answered, although he was determined to protect us in this moment. Then the first house was finally visible, the fog seemingly cleared scarcely enough to see what was directly in front of you. Everything was dead silent. Thinking about it, we haven't heard a thing the past half an hour. No birds. Nothing. Not even people. And that wasn't even the biggest problem. Where were the people? I don't like this. It feels like a ghost town. Joshua stammered. Gwen put her hand on Josh's shoulders and pointed into the distance. There were figures, standing still. The further we looked around, the more we saw. They're alive. Josh said in a sigh of relief and wanted to take a sprint to one of the people on the street. He was held back by Gwen who yanked him back and shook her head. How sure are you about that, Josh? Her voice was trembling. My gaze fell upon one of the figures closer to our group. Now I understood what she meant. After taking a good look, I started to wonder if we were even looking at people. It was as if they had started to become one with the fog, their bodies almost colorless, swaying in a ghastly form in the middle of the streets. There was nothing human about these creatures. Maybe they once were, but that gave a whole new set of questions. What are they then? Did the fog transform them into this? Will we become like them? Or are they bringers of the mist? And if they pass the town, they will take the cloud with them. As curious as I am, there was no way I wanted to find out the answer. We needed to leave, and quick. Through the fog, something seemed to approach us. Footsteps echoed from the across the stream. It was the first sound all of us had heard since we stepped into the fog. It was a bizarre thing to behold, but its green light filled us all with fear. A bulb of light swung from left to right like a will-o'-wisp, anticipating you to follow it. Sam was the first to act and swung Josh over his shoulder, who was too frightened to move. When he was ready to grab his girlfriend by the hand, she was no longer there. Panicking, he frantically looked around, hoping he hadn't lost a member of the group. However, it was already too late as Gwen stepped forward, enchanted by the light reaching to whatever it was. Gwen! He yelled at the top of his lungs. The light seemed to halt for a moment. Something was holding that thing, and I was pretty sure it was the source of whatever was going on here. Gwen was too far away to reach, so I did what I could. Grab Sam by his shirt and pull him into the nearest alleyway. He did his best to fight himself free, wanting nothing more than to save his girlfriend while Josh was dangling over his shoulder getting very dizzy. He put Joshua down and wanted to make another sprint back into the open stream. It was hard to pull him back, but he eventually collapsed to his knees crying. As quickly as I could, I covered his mouth as the green light drew near. 
My heart felt it was racing as if I had just run a marathon. A prayer slipped from Josh's lips, who sat curled up in a corner against a trash can. If anyone is up there, please hear this prayer. Let the light pass. The light drew closer, and a miracle needed a hand, or rather mine. With my free hand, I grabbed the first object I could find, an empty can and threw it around the corner of the alley. All of us froze up as we saw what looked like a cloaked figure fly by with a staff in his hand. I only saw a glimpse of it, but a crystal was dangling from it. After it passed the alley, Sam took the opportunity to grab both of us by the hand and leave through the other end of the alleyway. On the other side stood a small bus that seemed to have crashed itself into a lamppost. He pulled us inside and slid the door closed. What was that thing? Asked Joshua. I was still trying to catch my breath from running. It was truly a wonder that thing didn't end up changing its route and charge after us after we ran out of the alley. No idea, but it is not going to stop us from getting out of here. But first we need to... Sam said, panting. Before he could finish his sentence, I cut him off. Sam, I understand your feelings, but as long as that thing is looking for us, we can't go looking for Gwen all in the open. With a swift movement, he got up and yanked me by the collar. If you think that I am going to leave my girlfriend behind, then you are dead wrong, nerd. I love her more than anything in the world. I am willing to live to the end of my days together with her. He said, determined of the rescue mission he had already started planning. If you want her back, we need to work together. I answered him in a stern voice. Fine. What's your plan then? He said as he slowly let go of my collar and backed down. Josh seemed to calm down a little as well. The poor guy usually would panic when others got into an argument. Since he wasn't the loudest in the room, rather a doormat. Did you see where the light came from? I asked him, hoping that he would catch on. We all saw the damn light. He whispered loudly, not wanting to scream since that could blow the cover we currently had. It's a crystal. If I saw it correctly, it is hanging from a staff. If we can break it, we will have the upper hand. Whoever is holding on to it is luring people to it. And with that, I caught the attention of both my friends, who continued to listen as I explained the plan in further detail. Josh nodded as I gave everyone their roles, then looked up a little scared and unhappy with the situation he was going to be in. Seeing his realization kick in was a funny sight to Sam, who had a hard time keeping his laughter in. Okay, do both of you understand what we are going to do? They nodded, and as quick as we could, we grabbed what we could find within the bus. Everything that seemed heavy enough got stuffed inside bags. As if he had just struck gold, Josh held up something big and started feeling around the object to understand what he was holding. The inside of the van was dark, so it was hard to make out what everything was. Guys, it's a camera. And not a cheap one either, if I am correct. He put it on the floor beside him and started fumbling around the rest of the van. The walls of the van were covered with electrical devices and screens. I think we are in a broadcasting van, he concluded. The idea of a reporter and their team having been trapped here like ourselves gave us shivers. Since the van was empty, we all thought the same thing without saying it out loud. They didn't make it outside the town. You should hold on to that said Sam. Maybe if we get out of here, we can check if it has any footage of what happened. With that, Josh picked up the camera back up again and swung the bag over his shoulder. Shall we then? He said. The trembling in his voice was still there, but he seemed more confident of the situation. We were going to end this nightmare. The three of us had somehow made our way to the plaza. I stood at the side with the bags filled with God knows what. Sam had hidden himself near so he could take action, and Josh? Josh was bait. 
Cowardly, he stepped forward to the middle of the plaza, looking back in the direction of Sam every once in a while, who kept signing him that it was going to be okay and he should hurry. When Josh arrived at the place of destination, I grabbed the first thing and threw it into the middle of the square. The sound it made echoed and seemed to disappear after a couple of long seconds. A cold sweat had covered my back, but nothing came. The light had not shown itself. I wanted to give it another try, but Sam stood up and blew his cover. A ghostly figure had appeared in the plaza and stunned. From a distance, it looked like another figure that we had seen before, but this one seemed different. Gwen? He suddenly yelled, which startled both Joshua and me. Sam leaped forward to embrace his lover, only to be met by nothing at all. There was no solid being standing in front of him. It was a wonder. He still recognized her. A pair of lifeless eyes stared forward, her body swaying like smoke. It felt as if it was she wanted to say goodbye before she left the world behind. Tears had formed in Sam's eyes as he knew he was too late to save her, as there was nothing left. I'm staying, he said after a long pause. Even though it was impossible, he tried to embrace the figure in front of him. His tears evaporated into the fog. He had accepted his fate with a smile on his face as he slowly turned into a figure of the fog. The two eternalized in an embrace, forever in the fog. Josh had made his way over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. It was time to go. From the rooftops, a light had appeared. It had come after all. We witnessed a flash of green falling from the sky and collapsing to the ground. It stepped towards the middle of the square. The closer it got, the more figures appeared. They seemed to follow the crystal. When it reached the center, it stood still. Josh and I held our breaths. Neither of us knew if it knew we were there. The light shone brighter and the atmosphere changed. Wind circled around us and the crystal was heft up high. The fog was being sucked in. And not only that, the figures were forcefully swallowed by the crystal as well. No. I screamed knowing that everyone that once lived in this town was going to be trapped inside. Don't ask me where I got the guts from. My legs moved on their own, and I was headed for the thing controlling the crystal. Before I could leave a blow with my fist, it disappeared. When I blinked, everything was turned to normal. It was day again. Joshua and I had stood there in the middle of the square, just staring in disbelief. Our only thing left to do was to go back and leave the now abandoned town. Both of us knew that there were no survivors left. The fact that we were still alive to tell the tale was a wonder of its own. The walk back to the car seemed longer than it had been towards the town. Neither of us had any strength left in our bodies, yet we carried on our feet as we stumbled forward. The police cars were still unmoved, but more cars seemed to have appeared that weren't ours. The thought crossed my mind that more neighboring kids, that by now had grown up to be adults, had passed through the mist almost made me lose my balance. Joshua was luckily there to catch me before I dropped to my knees. We were not alone. I stuttered. How many have been turned into those things while we were there? God only knows if we knew we could have saved them. Joshua replied, his gaze back at the town that was in the distance. No, Josh, I don't think we could have. We never had the upper hand. That thing, whatever was holding the crystal, knew what it was doing. I looked up to Josh, trying to meet his gaze. Do you think it will follow us? To turn us into... He was scared to finish his sentence. It was something I had thought about as well, but I wasn't planning to find out. Just as I was about to reply, the two-way radio suddenly went off. A flood of screams was emitted from the small object that lied underneath one of the police cars. On cue, we flew towards the radio to grab a hold of it. Hello? Can someone hear me? I spoke loudly in the panic. The answer never came as the screams were cut off and the air grew silent once again. 
The police never believed what happened to us that day. The camera sadly didn't have more footage other than white noise, so that ended up being a failed attempt for evidence. But they still see the town as a mystery, as most people believe everyone just disappeared into thin air. Little do they know, Joshua and I are still uncertain of what we saw, but our friendship has been closer than ever before. We weren't planning on finding out when or how that thing was going to find us, so our mission is to find it first. My friend Joshua believes that if we break the crystal, we might be able to at least set the souls of the people free. That is the plan, and I am positive we can handle it together. After all, we are the people who were forgotten by the fog.